Welcome to the Boston Massacre of Family History, a virtual conversation with Serena Zabin, PhD. Thank you for joining us this evening for the special virtual program. My name is Hillary Miller, and I am the Director of Education at the Golden Ball Tavern Museum in Weston, Massachusetts. If you're not familiar with our history, the Golden Ball Tavern, built in 1768, was the home of Isaac Jones, a prominent British loyalist who later converted to the Patriot cause. The tavern was the site of the Weston Tea Party in 1774. The house was occupied and carefully preserved for 200 years by six generations of the Jones family before being acquired by the Golden Ball Tavern Trust in 1964 and opened as a museum. Our mission is to preserve the Golden Ball Tavern and to educate visitors of all ages by providing tours and programs that focus on the unique and well-documented stories of a loyalist family before, during, and after the American Revolution. Before we get started, I want to share some information and tips for tonight's program. Your video, you know, if you're uh, uh, attending tonight, your video is off, your microphones are off, I have been muted. This webinar features live captioning. To access live captioning, click on the, the live transcript button, button at the bottom of your screen and then select show subtitles. Please feel free to use the chat feature throughout the program to interact with one another. Uh, we will be utilizing Zoom's Q&A features for questions. There will be time for questions at the end of the program, um, but if you have them throughout the program, drop them in the box. We may get to them uh, during, during our discussion. But yeah, enter your questions into the Q&A box at any time. We are recording this program and we'll make it available on our YouTube channel in the near future if you wanna go back and rewatch it again. We'd like to thank our generous donors who continue to support the Golden Ball Tavern Museum's mission of preservation and education. If you'd like to contribute, you still may make a donation through the Eventbrite, Eventbrite page for this event. The link will be live until midnight tonight, or you can head into, let's see, I'm gonna drop the link into the chat. If you wanna go to our website and make a donation that way. Uh, we would also like to thank our speaker for the evening, Serena Zabin, PhD. Uh, professor Zabin is a professor of history, Broom Fellow for Public Scholarship, and Chair of the History Department at Carleton College. She is the author of the prize-winning The Boston Massacre of Family History, which was also named an Amazon Editor's Choice for History in 2020. Professor Zabin is also the co-designer of a video game, Witness to the Revolution, currently under development. It's just so fascinating. Uh, this immersive three-dimensional video game is an extension of her book, The Boston Massacre of Family History. And you'll be hearing more about that book and that story this evening. So at this time, I'd like to welcome Professor Serena Zabin. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me on. And I'm so pleased to actually talk both to you, Hillary, and to all of you um, thinking at, at virtually, I suppose, as we are here at the um, at the Golden Ball in because that's a story that is so um, adjacent or connected even to the story that I'm interested in telling, which is a question about loyalty and connection and how is it that people come to make the political choices that they do as they're embedded in social worlds. So that's the kind of heart of my of my questions. Um, so there are people from multiple states, including Weston and Natick, I see, and um, some, you know, um, oh, and Quincy, um, which is uh, also near and dear to my heart, as um, as both Josiah Quincy and um, John Adams have have their own role to play in my book. Um, but I thought perhaps it would be helpful helpful for some of you at least. Um, if I just gave us a little thumbnail sketch of maybe where the, um, what, what I'm talking about when I talk about the Boston Massacre, maybe that would be, be most helpful. So um, this is a story that I think most of us know from a little bit of grade school, certainly any of you who were raised up in Massachusetts as I was, um, probably have a little taste of it. And 
I expect that almost all of you know it really from Paul Revere's very, very famous engraving of that he calls the Bloody Massacre. Um, and I expect you all know it because that is an engraving that is reproduced in every single um, textbook and history of the revolution um, that there is out there. So what we know about the Boston Massacre is that one night in March of 1770, so before the Declaration of Independence, right, before Lexington and Concord, which I know is also an important piece for thinking about, you know, that Middlesex County world that many of you are in. Um, in 1770, there are troops in Boston um, and there's a lone sentry right in the center of Boston. So I know there's a lot of Massachusetts people here. So right in front of what's now the old state house, but what was then the townhouse, not really that old. Um, and um, there's a sentry stationed in front of the customs house, which is kind of kitty corner to it. Um, and we know that um, a number of people come and start talking to him. Um, some of them start pressing close to him as they're talking in ways that are perhaps feel a little threatening. Um, he, and he starts to feel threatened. He calls for backup. Some other troops come um, to support him, another handful of soldiers. Um, and more civilians show up also in this space um, between the uh, customs house and the state house. Um, things are being thrown. It's dark. It's about nine o'clock at night in, in March. So not unlike, you know, what you all are experiencing now. Um, Boston, by the way, has no street lights in 1770. That might be worth thinking about. Um, so it's quite dark. And at some point, someone yells fire. And it's quite unclear who yells fire or why, whether this is a command for the troops to fire, whether um, people think that maybe there was a fire and they're supposed to show up with their fire buckets, as indeed some of them do. Um, possibly it was sort of a taunt said by civilians to soldiers saying, you don't dare fire because you haven't actually read us the riot act yet. So you have no right to fire upon us. Nobody really knows where that word fire came from, but the soldiers heard it and some of them fired. And essentially when the smoke cleared, there were five Bostonians either dead or dying on the snow in front of the kind of center of Massachusetts government, right? Um, and it was a shocking scene. And that's the event that will come to be known as the Boston Massacre. But at the time, what it really is, is a shooting. It's a shooting of civilians by soldiers that comes to take on a large political meaning. And what I was interested in doing in this book is sort of unpacking the story behind it, unpacking the story about how soldiers got there, who these civilians were, and then how an event comes to have this kind of meaning. That is the, the great summary of all of it and really shows us you know, how much we don't know <laughs> um, when it's an event that we all feel like we know so much. So there's so many unknowns and then so much of the story that doesn't typically get told. And you know, kind of thinking about your book, um, I mean, you put an interesting spin on it. I mean, right on page one, you mentioned, you say that it may seem strange to begin an account of the Boston Massacre with a woman in Ireland. You're like, whoa, that does seem strange because of what we think we know about this event and where it kind of sits in our collective memory. So yours is definitely a surprising new slant on the story of the Boston Massacre. So how, how did you discover it? How did you get to this new take on it? So, right. I start with a woman named Jane Chambers, who's a woman that I came um, to feel a real connection to. But the book opens with her actually um, embarking on a troop ship from Ireland um, in 1765, holding her child, following her husband, who's a member of the 29th Regiment. And they're going not to Boston, but actually to Halifax. Um, and I was really interested in all of these women and children who travel with the British Army, because it turns out that the British Army is a kind of family institution. Um, 
so I, I came across the story of Jane Chambers and others actually um, because I, I came across a mentor and a mention of a soldier's wife talking to Bostonians in their house in, in Boston um, in a very, very well-known pamphlet that gets um, put together by the town meeting essentially of Boston. After the shooting, they collect a whole bunch of depositions about what happened that night? What did you see? Um, and they um, they put this together really to try to shape kind of public opinion. And they, they try to put it together in a sort of chronological order to tell a story. And the story they wanna tell is the story that says, oh, soldiers were planning this attack on civilians from the beginning. So they're really focused on this question. Well, who is making all these threats? How do we know that they were focused on it? So they they interview some guy who says, well, actually, you know, I'm sitting in this house having a drink and the soldier's wife said, you know, um, if I ever, um, you know, there, there, there's going to be violence in the streets. And if I see a Bostonian lying on the ground, I'd put stones in my handkerchief and beat his brains out, which is, you know, an, quite an impressive statement there. And most people, both at the time and later, sort of pick that up as a question of, um, a, a threat, right? They're like, oh, look, everybody knew that this was going to happen. But I actually was was teaching a, a, a class on trials in early America, and I had taken my class to, um, to read this pamphlet. Turned out how here in Minnesota, we have an original copy of it. And, um, and it took a while, but then I started thinking like, who is this soldier's wife who's like sitting in this Bostonian's house? And I started thinking, why is there a soldier's wife here? Like, I didn't even realize that soldiers' wives would be in Boston. And then I started to wonder, why is she in a Bostonian's house sitting around having drinks? Like, why is she in someone's kitchen having a beer? What is that about? And that was really the question that um, started sort of be on this track to this question of soldiers' wives. Why are they in Boston? And when I went to Boston and started doing the research, my first morning in the archives, which is always sort of amazing, I found some records of soldiers marrying local Bostonians. And I thought, wow, the story is just lying here in plain sight, it's kind of waiting to be told. And the more I looked, the more I found that really there's an immense amount of evidence to show us that there were lots and lots of Irish women, British women, and Boston women who were part of the family that becomes the British army. that I, I could keep talking. Um, it's not letting me unmute. Now you're unmuted. Oh, when you know, now you're muted again. It's not showing me that it's unmuted. I presume you can hear me now. My apologies. So I have to actually hold the button now, down at this point. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's really uncovering an aspect of you know, military history, but just generally you know, US history uh, that just how many people, you know, we think about military history in a, in a certain way, I think with just very much focused on men and with their actions. And yeah, we don't really stop to think about this, this larger community of all of these people who are there to support them, but also just trying to live their lives. And I think that's really one of the wonderful things you get to in this is just people trying to live their lives and you know being in these extraordinary circumstances. And you know, with this being you know, you know really defining the Boston Massacre as a family history, um, it kind of does something you know to the way that we understand the origins of the American Revolution. Uh, could you say a little bit more about you know, how that might change the way we think about the revolution? Yeah, I mean, so I call this, as you say, right, I call this a family history. And by that, I actually mean two, two things, because we, we often think of the Boston Massacre as this sort of milestone, right, on the way to the American Revolution, sort of perfectly poised between the 1765 Stamp Act, right, and 1775, Lexington and Concord. Oh, 1770, how perfect is that, right? Um, and it sort of seems like it's meant to 
be there, that it's just that there's this road and, and here's here's a marker on, on the way. But what the book really shows is how difficult it is for Bostonians and Britons generally to start to imagine themselves as Americans, right? In 1770, most Britons, including those living in Massachusetts, imagine themselves to be a loyal part of the British Empire, right? They're like, we're really English people here. Um, and so what makes this interesting as a family history is that we often think of the revolution as a political event, right? Um, but in fact, it's it's more than that. It's more like I mean, the metaphor I use in the book is that it's like a bad divorce, right? That the families that I'm talking about are both the families that make up the empire and especially make up the arms of the empire, which is the army itself, but also that that I, I want to look at that metaphor itself that, you know, we use about the mother country, right, in the colonies as these ungrateful children. But really, um, the the American Revolution becomes this, this sort of ugly divorce between colonists and, um, and the empire in which there's this complicated web of relationships that are made between civilians and soldiers, right, between colonists and sort of Britons. Um, and these soldiers help us see that when the revolution comes, it's not just political bonds that are broken, but human ones. Yes, certainly. Um, I, I think of thinking about it as a divorce, yeah, is a, is a really useful way. And yeah, that family history, how personal it is. Um, and that, of course, I think uh, ties a lot into, and we were discussing for everybody else, we were discussing this a little bit before we started tonight about the Golden Ball Tavern and um, our kind of our main person that we, we look at um, is a loyalist turned patriot and thinking about just how complicated you know, those relationships are in communities, in families, you know, thinking about it kind of on a regional or a, you know, a colony wide or kind of this American colonies versus versus Great Britain type of level. So yeah, I think that is that a really wonderful example of of really how we kind of blow all of that apart here, you know, break it apart to take a, a deeper look at it. So I'm sure though, when you were digging through all of these, you know, all of these resources and pulling together the lives of the people in your in your book, um, something had to have surprised you. So did you, was, was there something that was stand out as the most surprising thing while you were researching this book? So I think there are two parts to that, right? So one is, um, as I said, I felt like the story, once I started looking was sort of just lying there in plain sight. And so one thing that surprised me is that nobody had noticed before, right? As you say, we think of the both military history and the Boston uh, massacre is kind of this guy history, right? It's like a bunch of bored guys with guns and that's kind of all there is to say about it. Um, and I, so I was amazed that they, I could find these military civilian relationships in so many places, right? These like scraps of paper that were receipts showed all kinds of things. Um, there were bits of terrible poetry in the newspapers, right, that also reveal this, um, lots of stuff in churches, many other pieces that, that, so I was surprised that nobody had told the story before. And then the other piece that I just found amazing, actually, was um, when I started really digging into what it meant to have the British Army in Boston um, between 1768 and 1772, I was kind of shocked at the rate of desertion. That piece really surprised me, right? So soldiers in Boston were deserting the army at something like three times the rate that other soldiers were deserting, even in the 18th century, even in other parts of North America. And desertion didn't actually happen just in the ways that we might think about it, right? So sometimes deserters maybe went as far as New Hampshire. There's a whole kind of world of, of deserters and other people who've like, you know, sort of disappeared into New Hampshire. Sometimes they stay right underneath their commander's their noses right in Boston. Um, but I was surprised at how many people left and how revealing a story that was about the kinds of connections that soldiers were making with locals. 
Yeah, I and mean, and there's so many interesting parts to your book, and that certainly is your discussions of deserters, and uh, it's something we don't typically tend to think about. But the, yeah, those those family relationships there, and how you know those may have aided or hurt <laughs> efforts of deserters in some ways. It's just it's really fascinating. Uh, so thinking about, you know, we keep talking about, you know, all of this information that's kind of hiding right under our noses this whole time that maybe we we aren't telling. Um, I mean, what would you say about this, about your work, about this retelling of the Boston Massacre is unique and new? So I think um, it's always hard to think about what is new as we're talking about the story of the revolution, right? We think about well, what is it that other people don't know, but what is it? that's really new. Um, and so I think that, you know, what's new about this story, I think, is that um, we, we often imagine, especially if we think about that Revere engraving, right, um, that, that the story that we know of the Boston Massacre are these kind of increasing tensions, that's the language everybody likes to use, right, um, that ends with gunfire in the street. It's like somehow, I don't know, downtown Boston's become the OK Corral or something, right? You know, it's just um, this wild story. But, and and of course people are, people die. I don't mean to discount that, right? Like there is gunfire, um, but it's also the story about love, about family, um, about real people, right? Real men and women, about children and, and their deaths, which are often much quieter and much sadder from, you know, from disease or, um, you know, other, you know, kind of just illness. Um, and so this history takes ideas that we often think of as diametrically opposed, right? So women's history and military history or desertion and families, like I just talked about, right? And shows that they're actually all intimately connected with each other, right? And that we need to take seriously the stories of these people that we've never thought really counted. Right. And these are especially, I think, women who travel with the army. Yeah, I, I agree. It's definitely a, a unique and new way to, to look at this. And especially thinking about, we just passed the 250th anniversary of the Boston Massacre. Um, we are heading, we are barreling into the 250th of overall the American Revolution. Um, in just a couple of years, we will be commemorating those events at, you know, our events at the Golden Ball Tavern. So, you know, thinking about where we are with, you know, your telling of the story, you know, we're in the midst of the 250th right now. I mean, what relevance, if any, does the Boston Massacre have today? So, yeah, I think that's, that there's a couple of pieces of possible answers to that. And there's a, a hopeful one and there's a, um, a more challenging one. So the hopeful one, I think, comes from my understanding of, um, you know, what really happened that night as opposed to the story that Revere and other people want to tell, right? So if you think about that Revere engraving, those of you can see it in your mind's eye or look it up on your computer, right? You, you know that the soldiers are all standing in this line right on the right side of the picture and um, Captain Thomas Preston, who's the commanding officer standing safely behind them, right? Waving a sword, telling them, you know, go on. And all these civilians, these sort of middle-class looking, well-dressed civilians are, um, you know, on the other side, all of them looking, you know, kind of innocent and many of them with blood pouring out of them. Um, one woman kind of looking horrified. Um, and, you know, we know in lots of ways that that picture is not accurate, but one of the pieces that I think is least accurate about it that we haven't paid that much attention to is the fact that between the soldiers on the one side and the civilians on the other, Revere puts this thick white line of gun smoke, right? That's the gun that's coming out of this, uh, the smoke that's coming out of the soldiers' guns. But it becomes this dividing line, right? As though civilians are on one side of the story and soldiers are on the other side of the story and there's no connection between them whatsoever. Well, in fact, that part of the story is not, I mean, that part of Revere's picture is not true at all, right? There's millions of connections between these soldiers and those civilians, I mean, including quite specifically 
there are soldiers who know people in the crowd that night. I mean, there really are connections between them, but Revere for his own political reasons really wanted to um, downplay those connections, right? And the other Sons of Liberty also, they, they really wanted it to look as though the soldiers had zero connection with civilians. Um, and I think of that sometimes as a metaphor for our own kind of political divisions, right? That we imagine ourselves as a lot more divided than we might really be, right? That when we look around, our neighbors really are our neighbors, right? They're people with whom we disagree politically, perhaps, but but we have other connections with them that are also meaningful. They're also the people that we go and borrow a cup of sugar from, right? They're also the people that we ask to help jumpstart our car. They're also the people whose you know kids go to school with ours. Um, so the optimistic read is that like we're not as divided as we think we are. I think that. The harder story really is this question of violence, right? Like what is the presence of violence and its relationship to the ordering, the orders of the of the government, right? So at what moment, um, and I know that there are some questions, especially about Christmas addicts out there, right? At what moment does it, um, do soldiers who are invested, who have their guns because the state gave it to them when they're shooting, you know, um, unarmed or lightly armed, you know, civilians of African descent in particular, right, on the streets of Boston, how do we think about that in a contemporary context? And that's a really important question. I think also that um, in the 250th, um, you know, people are really grappling with, I know Revolutionary Spaces, which is the historical organization sort of charged with interpreting the um, old state house and Boston Massacre, you know, put together a really wonderful exhibit on um, something, on, on Christmas Addicts, the name of which will come to me in a moment. Um, you know, kind of, was it Reflecting Addicts? Reflecting Addicts, yeah. exactly, thank you. Um, that is, you know, um, that asks us to think about what that relationship um, looks like over time, right? And, and while the soldiers are not police, right? So the eight, 18th century cities didn't have police forces. Paris is just starting to think about this, but nowhere in the Anglophone world are there police, right? There's some constables, there's a night watch, but there's no police. And the reason the soldiers are in Boston is because the governor asks for these um, peacetime regiments to come and support the state, right? Support his government, um, try to shut down on some smuggling and riots and other things um, because because there's no police to ask. And this is a pretty standard ask across Britain, you know, that peacetime soldiers are often used to do this kind of crowd control, especially for riots. Um, overall, military men hate being used as police, right? And in fact, when these regiments get the order that they're being sent to Boston to basically do urban policing, every officer who can manage it manages, who can manage it, sorry, um, asks to go home, right? So at one point, I think there's six in a day, but there's many, many that, you know, these letters that the commanding officers are getting saying like, my grandmother's dying, I gotta go, right? Um, and because they all realize that this is going to ruin their careers, right? Which it sort of does for some of them. Um, so so the problem of, you um, of being a police force is something that these people are pretty cognizant of, but they're not a police, right? They're an army. Um, and in that way, there the parallel falls down. Um, but I think it helps us reflect on this presence of violence and especially um, its relationship to, um, to race. I think that you bring up some you know, really important points for us to consider uh, you know, where we are right now um, and really just generally heading into this 250th about you know, meanings of, of independence, of freedom, of equality, you know, all those ideals in the Declaration of Independence 
um, and that lasting legacy. And something that I think you really get at very nicely in your book, you know, really talks about this usefulness of history. You, know, you have Revere right away, you know, kind of shaping, you know, how the historic record is going to look at this event. And, you know, we talked about, you know, the, the great exhibit right now that Revolutionary Spaces has. Um, again, it reflects over time about that, that usefulness of the history, how history is being used at, at any moment in time. Um, and I, I think that that's something that, that's incredibly useful, you know, for us to keep in mind, you know, taking a look at your book. Thanks. So, you know, with that in mind, you know, thinking about that usefulness and how we're, we're using history and you know, thinking about it at this point, um, if I think about kind of the audience, you know, for, for your book and just generally what we're doing at places like the Golden Ball Tavern, the old state house, all of these places. You now, for you, for, for your book, I mean, what kind of reader, you know, is, do you think that this book will appeal to, you know, and especially as you are you know, kind of getting them to think about the ba the Boston Massacre in this new way. Yeah, I mean, I I think I hope, but I, I'm pretty sure that this book appeals to people who like um, who like to meet other people, right? I mean, this book is just studded with um, you know with with kind of true life stories, right? Of um, of the people that you know, that a reader might recognize in some ways, right, from their own lives, but who lived in a world that's really different from the one we live in today, right? And in that way, it's kind of like going to a novel, right? Where you're like, okay, I I kind of can see how these are people that I that I might know, but but I'm moved into a different, a different world. Um, and it's also, I think, for people who want to know about how the lives of ordinary people shape momentous events and how momentous events shape the lives of ordinary people. That's an excellent way of putting it. Um, yeah, I think that's really useful. And you had so many you know, interesting people that we did meet in, in your book and it's just so many you know, colorful characters and they were all up to something different. I mean, this is very much a book of ordinary people and, and I mean, it has everything in it that I think you would want. I mean, there is there is sex and violence and just people doing normal things like trying to have their life and raise their kids. Um, yeah. You know, but with all of that in mind, I mean, could you tell us about you know, maybe a, a character who stayed with you? Yeah, I mean, so I have a couple, right? There's like the ones that moved me and the ones the charmed me, right? Um, and I, you know, I I love them all, even the people who behave very poorly. Um, but I think the one that really stuck with me is is actually Jane Chambers, with whom I opened the book and who shows up multiple times. Um, and and I'd say she she really moved me in part because she's she was for me the kind of example of. Um, of a woman who, you know, moved across three separate continents, right? She had these voyages. I was able to find her there. Um, but what she was really trying to do was keep her family together, right? She's trying to follow her husband. She has multiple children. Um, and I would say, um, you know, a couple of years, I'd found her in a, in a number of different places and I kept my eye out for her. Um, but several years into researching the book, I was actually at the Boston Public Library, and I discovered not only, I think in Massachusetts Historical Society, the receipt from a doctor for treating her child, um, but also a receipt from the town of Boston, it was then a town, um, for the burial of a, a soldier's child. And by putting the dates together, um, it was clear to me that this was her child who was buried on a island out in Boston Harbor. Um, and I think the fact that this child that she'd worked so hard to keep alive, to be part of this family, was buried without a name that all that was left of this child was just this little, like truly a little scrap of a receipt that just said burial ch soldier's child, you know, to the sexton, seven shillings. Um, I mean, I just, cried in the Boston Public Library. Um, I was so moved by finding this little bit of this child's life, right? Um, 
and so that that piece really I think moved me and stuck with me and her attempts to to have a family it's really meaningful that is really some incredible work you've done there in the archive you know being able to piece together that story and something that we just have this, like you said, a little scrap of paper. That's all that's left for us. But you know, this was very, very big. You know, for the people living through this, and you know, being able to tell those stories is very powerful. I mean, you had a lot of other, you know, really interesting characters too. I'm, I'm sure that yeah, there are many stories that stand out to you. It's true. I mean, I will say to you know have a slightly happier note than this poor woman um, that there's another soldier, a private named William Clark, whom I just kind of you know, really do love. He's like charming and he's sort of irrepressible. He's a private soldier with literary ambitions, right? Um, so he comes to Boston, he publishes this play, and then he has an affair with a Boston woman and he marries her after her grandfather, who happens to be a son of liberty, finds them together in bed, right? Um, and then the next year he writes this tell all memoir, right? And he publicly calls out his in-laws for all the grief that they gave him after, you know, he threatens his father-in-law with a pistol and he's, you know, he's in jail. Um, you know, he's like the Forrest Gump of all of these pieces, right? He shows up everywhere. Um, I mean, this one was terribly sad to me that there, neither the play nor the memoir seems to have survived, um, which was, you know, sort of devastating, but even the titles were enough to really um, make me laugh aloud. Yeah, I, I was hoping you would say William Clark. <laughs> Love William he's, Clark. He's just so incredibly fascinating. And you're right, um, I, I, it hurt me that, you know, when, when you said that, that that didn't, that the play and the memoirs, it didn't survive. I mean, hopefully we, it's in somebody's attic somewhere and we can find it. <laughs> that would be great. But um, yeah, a, a wonderful story that really just humanizes the, the whole event and this whole situation in just such a different way. I, I think just, yeah, just sheds light on you know, just how complicated all of these relationships were. And this isn't just a, a quick, you know, one time thing that happens. It's like these are their whole world. Yeah, these are people living together, you know for almost a year and a half before the shooting, right? And then some of them are there for several years later, they have time to build relationships, to, to know each other. I, I mean, I really think in some ways, you know, we, we tend to let guys tell the story, right? Especially the Sons of Liberty, especially Revere, as I say, who might, you know, I don't really have any personal thing about, I, I know I keep using his, his engraving as a thing to attack, but, you know, really, um, they, they've told our story, but I, I actually um, think that Jane Austen is a better storyteller for us. So I often think that this is a story that looks a lot like Pride and Prejudice, if you remember what that looks like, right? Where all of, where, you know, when, when a regiment shows up, um, all of these young women are freely interested, right? The men are all freaked out, right? If you remember what, you know, um, Mr. Bennett cannot control his daughters, um, but the daughters are all really interested and they have relationships with these soldiers. Um, and that I think is really, is really the story of what's happening in Boston, right? Not the story the Sons of Liberty want us to hear. Yeah, I think that's uh, bringing Austin into it. Is, that really does help, help things make sense. And yeah, all of these, all these young men show up in their uniforms and yeah it's this is a this is a big deal <laughs> for especially the young women <laughs> right and boston is majority female i think that's worth saying too right after the seven years war i mean a lot of young men are killed and so some of it is that you know there's fewer men than there were and some of it is that um like all these port cities or towns um you know, young women from places like Weston, right, um, go to look for wage work there, right? So there are a lot of women looking for husbands. Oh, definitely. And, you know, to tell these stories, though, I mean, we've talked about this a little bit, you know, the, the scrap of paper that you had to pull together this story. Um, you've had to be a little bit creative um, because we're so used 
we have those documents, the Sons of Liberty, you know, their versions of the story. Um, but you're looking at it from a new perspective. So sometimes you have to be a little bit more creative and think outside of the box with coming up with your, your sources. So could you say a little bit more about you know, your sources and, and the research that went into this fantastic book? Sure. I mean, I had a great time researching this book. I hope you could tell from the way I talk about the people. I loved these people. I loved, you know, chasing them down. Um, so the book does depend on really, a, you know, a huge amount of research. Ten years I spent on it, uh, which was truly a, a labor of love because it was so fun. Um, but yeah, I looked at sources in the U.S., in Canada, in Ireland, as well as in England. Um, and so I did hunt people through all these different archival materials, very few of which actually identified any of these men as soldiers, right? That was one of the more interesting things I, I found. Um, and so, you know, as I was tracking these people down, I ended up creating this very elaborate relational database. Actually, I, I found all the muster rolls for all of the soldiers, there's about 2000 guys who come to Boston and with the help of some Carleton students, we typed all of their names into this database and we spent about a year you know, kind of cleaning it up and double checking and making sure that we had, you know, the right William Clark and the right company, right, as opposed to the other three William Clarks who also were part of, who were in Boston at the time. Um, and, um, and then I, so I plotted them both in this database and then on a digital map, which, you know, can lead us if you want to talk a little bit about the game, um, because the database and the map helped me kind of keep them straight, right? I was trying to figure out what are the relationships between all of these soldiers, some of whom say show up in Massachusetts courts as, you know, people who have to pay paternity support or who have been, you know, whatever, stealing shoes, right? Lots of different reasons they might show up in court, not often identified as soldiers. And so I needed to know who, who were they, who are they, who are they stealing those shoes with, right? Who are they pawning them to? Um, so what were all their relationships? How many of them are, are, congregant, are, are congregating, excuse me, around public houses, different public houses, right? Where neighbors start to complain, things like that. Um, so I mapped them all out. And then at the same time, I had to draw on all kinds of other people's specialized knowledge, right? About how do armies work? How do court systems work? What are the politics? What are the religious practices that um, encourage soldiers to ask locals to act as godparents for their children, right? Which turns out to be one of the ways that they really make these fictive families, right? That civilian and, and military families come together over baptism. Um, and those help me, I think, connect these little fragments because mostly, as you said, I was just finding fragments, but when I put them into a big enough database, um, I was able to tell more coherent stories, right? That help us understand people in the past. It was a lot of work and it was a ton of fun. That does sound like fun. And I guess that's a bit of a, being a nerdy historian myself, I'm like, oh, that <laughs> the mapping, that is, that is great. But it does, it allows you to see those relationships and think about these you know, in a very spatial way and be able to see the story come together. And since yeah. you mentioned it, and I was going to ask anyways, um, I just would love to hear, or if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit more about the video game, because that's not something you typically you know, think of or hear about you know, from a, a, you know, something about history of becoming a video game. So it's true. We'd love to know more. So I, so I wanna start by saying that really at this point, um, I've done as much as I can. I'm not a technical person and I'm not an artist. So mostly now the game is in the hands of two spectacular colleagues, a colleague of mine at Carleton, Austin Mason, who's our digital um, humanist and someone actually at the University of Wisconsin Stout, um, Andrew Williams, who's um, been sort of leading this team of people turning into a game. But where it came from was actually this map, right? So I, I mapped, all the people I could find um, and, you know, learned that there were soldiers and their families spread out all over 
the town of Boston. Um, and then I had students in one class I thought, well, well, we'll look at all those depositions that tell us where people were at the time of the shooting and, and what they came, or what routes they took to see um, what was going on that night. I thought, well, maybe it'll be interesting to see whose houses they walk by or who they run into. But it turns out that all we saw, which would surprise nobody after kind of a lot of work, um, is that everybody ran to the place where the shooting was. <laughs> it's like, well, that was kind of stupid, right? Like that was not the best use of our time. But I had a couple of students who found the process really fascinating. They said, well, we really want to work on this. And we want to think about how do we know, how do, how do we know what the right routes were when people just said, well, I just walked and then I ran into this person. And so they worked on that for a while. And then they said, it'd be so much more interesting if we could walk like these people, if we could see what they saw. And to do that, we need three dimensions, right? Because nobody walks looking like a bird flying over a, a map. Um, so then we tried to, to turn these 18th century maps of Boston into these three-dimensional cities that you could walk around in. That was the point that I started needing uh, some more help, right? It turns out that actually this requires a lot of physics that I didn't have, but my students were spectacular. So then we started, um, you know, we're like, oh, that's kind of interesting to walk around. And then I would say, like, honestly, the first 10 minutes, the students were like, well, we should gamify this. And I'm not a gamer. And I thought, what could this be? And they said, oh, this is going to be so exciting. So honestly, it was my students who convinced me that this should be a game at all. Um, and so the, the game that we have come up with is essentially... Um, it's the day after the shooting and the um, selectmen are collecting these depositions and you're kind of dropped into this as the player, you're dropped into town and you're trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and so you are walking around also helping collect these depositions. And so you find people who had seen things that night and you ask them what they saw and you sort of record um, in your little journal what they tell you. And then you need to turn it into a coherent story, right? Because you're going to get so much contradictory evidence because that's what basically people saw that night because as I said, it's dark and there's no streetlights and people see all kinds of things. Um, and so your job is to figure out how can this be turned into something coherent? And, and the kind of larger question is, you know, what do you lose when you're trying to make a coherent story as opposed to understanding the fact that actually this historical story doesn't have a single thread that leads us through it. That just sounds so fascinating. And I guess that's that, that messy aspect of history, that it's just not all yeah coherent and different perspectives coming into play. Um, so that just sounds amazing. And it's really great that your students are really, you know, we're really pushing you know, toward this. Um, it's something that in, in the history field, we've been talking more and more about these, you know, these, the technology and how to use it. And it, this is a wonderful application of that technology. So I know that everybody is probably thinking, when can I get my hands on this game? So that is a good question. And now that I am just, you know, I, it's true that I was sort of a co-designer at this point. I think I'm the historical consultant. Um, so I, you know, I think that there's some hope that next year there'll be something, some parts that you can play test. We had a little, a, a pretty fun chunk where um, you're actually another, you're, you're in the um, tavern actually. And, um, and you have a little mini quest where you have to make flip because you're actually the barmaid um, you're, who's one of the women, Jane Crothers, who gives evidence. Um, and it, you have to give flip and make flip. And at the same time, you're supposed to actually try to steal some stuff for the black market. Um, and then you hear the shooting and you go out to see what's going on. And that piece actually, um, we pretty much finished um, during the pandemic. So my hope is that they're you know, looking for some funding that they're going to get a little further on it and that they'll be seeing some play tests in the next year. So. Well, we are certainly looking forward to just hearing about your progress with that and, and hopefully get to, to try it out at some point. Um, and if anybody you know, watching tonight you know, is interested, uh, you know, make sure you sign up for Golden Ball Tavern you know, to get on our mailing list. 
Um, and then I'm sure that uh, Professor Zabin, you and I can you know, work on getting the details later when you have them. And I will share that with our Golden Ball Tavern community too. Because I know that you know, you've mentioned a tavern theme now. So we need to, we need to definitely try that out. Um, so we are starting to get a little short on time. And I do want to make sure that we get to questions. Um, Professor Zabin, can you see the questions on your end? My controls have all frozen up. So sure, I don't sure. know if I want to try before I yeah, end up destroying it. Absolutely. The so there's a question that came in um, from um, Nancy Goodale, who has um, some a question who'd like me to talk a little more about Crispus Attucks and his relationship to Framingham and to William Brown, who's um, known as the person who had possibly held addicts or certainly his mother as a, um, a, a enslaved. Um, and so asking, you know, what else we know? Um, so let me say a couple of things about addicts. So one is that we know frustratingly little, right, about his life. And there's a wonderful book um, by Mitch Ketchum, Ketchum? Um, K-A-T-C-H-U-M, who really went through and tried to find everything there is to find. Um, and it's not that much, right? Um, so, um, and I, I actually don't know that much about William Brown of Framingham, although I, I, I will say Framingham was an, a place where a number of those um, deserters, you know, find themselves. Some of them have some family there that they go out to find. It, it feels less far from Boston, actually, even at that time than we might imagine. But um, but addicts, as you probably all know, had left Framingham um, a good 10 years earlier, at least, and um, had been sailing, right? He was, he was a, on a, he was a sailor um, when he shows back up in Boston. So, um, so sadly, I'm, I'm sorry, I know the real question was like, can I tell you much about William Brown, which I cannot. Um, but about addicts, I think I'd, I'd say two things, which is really about story making, right? So one is, as I was saying about this computer game, one of the things that we really want people to see is what gets lost as you try to make a story, right? And one of the things I talk about in my book is what John Adams does to Crispus Attucks as he tries to make a story for the jury to understand, right? It's a really confusing night. There's lots of testimony, lots of testimony just gets spoken. And, um, and then it's John Adams's job to pull it all together in a closing and tell a story for the jury. And the story he tells for the jury basically is that, you know, these soldiers shot in self-defense, because as you all remember, I'm sure John Adams's job there was to defend the soldiers, right? Which always seems funny to us, um, but he wasn't prosecuting on behalf of the Crown or the town of Boston, he was defending the soldiers. And his argument for the soldiers is that this is self-defense, but not against like wild Bostonians. His argument is that this is self-defense against these outside agitators, right? Which is a language that we now know about rioters. Um, that really, these are people who came in from outside and because they're not real Bostonians, they're apprentices, they're Irish people, and they are people of mixed descendants, right? They're, they're mixed people um, like addicts and addicts is this kind of example number one. And I'd say that this is a place where Adams really does kind of play a race card where he says, you know, of course, Soldiers had to defend themselves, but don't worry. It's not that Boston looks bad here. Boston still looks good, right? Um, my job here is to make sure the Sons of Liberty come out looking okay and Boston looks okay. And so they're not the ones who are rioting. It's really just these other people, these Irish people, right? These African descended people, these indigenous people, apprentices, they're the ones who are doing it. Um, so that's part of the story, but the other maybe more positive piece of the story um, is that the story of addicts dying gets picked up in the 19th century and used by some of the earliest Black American um, or historians of American history um, to tell a story of Black patriotism, right? That um, 
that really sets up an argument that says, you know, this is why actually Massachusetts should be supporting the union when it comes to civil war, right? And ending slavery and supporting the abolitionist cause is because black people have been fighting for this promise of American liberty from the beginning. And that's when addicts comes to be known as the first martyr of liberty. Um, and it's no reason for a person to die, but it's a way in which that um, that death comes to have meaning, important meaning for the African-American community in Boston. Um, so that's what I can say about addicts. Um, so that's the major question. Uh, people have other ones. I think we've got just another minute or two. It's quick again, but I think that's one of the pieces. So again, if anybody has questions, please feel free to drop them into the Q&A or down into the chat. Um, but yeah, that was a great question. And, uh, you know, really getting at you know, all of these nuances, you know, the nuance of the whole event and the remembrance of it. And yeah, thinking ahead to, to your video game. And I mean, the video game is kind of, you know, it's part of this, the book and the video game is part of this tradition as well, you know, of really examining this event and, you know, thinking about you know, what we learn about it and the usefulness of it you know, at any moment in time. And I think for many of us, that's the fascination of thinking about the American Revolution and the American founding, right? Is trying to think what is their, what is our relationship, right? To, uh, um, to a country and a world in which we now live but that has so many of its, you know, kind of central, I don't know, tap roots or something in the 18th century, which is a, a different world, right? That um, where people had really different goals for themselves and, and for a country, and yet also, of course, shared lots of things. We have a real shared humanity with many of these people. So trying to balance, how is it that the world feels different? How is it that there is, um, you know, and, and how is it that these people are the same? That I think is just part of our challenge of thinking about where do we fit in an America that was, you know, kind of birthed in this early moment. Um, Certainly, and, and this world is definitely one that you beautifully recreate in your book. And um, we'll say that I am sure that there are many folks out there who have not ha yet had the opportunity to look through your book, um, but the Golden Ball Tavern you know, can definitely share information on where to find this wonderful book. Um, and with that, though, I would like to thank you, uh, Professor Zabin, for joining us this evening to discuss your, your fascinating work. And thank you to our Zoom audience for joining us for the special virtual presentation.